Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jacqueline Dorsey of Lane Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. I'm excited to bring to you today a short webinar called The Heart and Soul of Manufacturing facilitated by Bill Waddell, Michelle Nashhoff, and Jim Hunsinger. Jim, the president and founder of Lane Frontiers, will be serving as an MC and asking questions presented by our listeners. Bill, who will be sharing his insights, is a Lean consultant, author, and thinker and teacher who has been defining and working at the leading edge of Lean for over 20 years. Michelle, who will also be sharing her insights, is founder and president of ElectroFab Sales, a sales agency specializing in helping manufacturers select the right processes for their products. This uh, webinar is actually a continuation of one we did last month. Um, so for those of you who missed it, you'll be able to catch that at our website at lightwise.com. Um, please note that this will be recorded if you want to refer back to it later. So for now, let me turn things over to Jim. All right. Thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, hello, everyone. And thank you to Michelle and Bill for being here with us. And uh, as um, Jacqueline had said this is really a continuation. It is a continuation of part two, I guess, of the webinar we had a few weeks ago, said the heart and soul of manufacturing. And we had a great discussion then, lots of questions, and we just, uh, we didn't make it through all the questions, but uh, went through a lot of the questions. But what we wanted to do this time, which we were planning on getting to the last time, but we just had so much, so many good questions and discussion, was to really kind of get in a conversation about, in regards to uh, Bill's. Bill Waddell's book, The Heart and Soul of Manufacturing, which is what this webinar is based on. So we want to try to, we're going to concentrate on, on the content of that with discussion with Michelle and Bill. And uh, just in some of our email exchanges, as we're working on this with myself and Michelle and Bill, just kind of what we want to talk about in the context of this is, um, and this is actually something Michelle had sent out when we were kind of talking about it, you know how the total transformation of a culture of a company into a lean company really provides opportunities for people at all levels in the manufacturing industry and to practice integrity in the conduct of their business and feel good about contributing to their company, their community, and their country, which in a sense is what Bill was talking about in this book. And uh, you know, Michelle said that's what really touched her soul when she read the book. So that's why we want to get to that and talk about that. So I'll start off with the first question for Bill and Michelle, and you guys jump right in and we'll get on the conversation was you kind of start off the book with um, a comment about um, rooted in a higher power. So if you want to kind of go through and talk about what do you mean by by talking about manufacturing being rooted in a higher power? I'll let you go first, Bill. Okay. Um, Jim, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have a little problem with my mute button here. Well, you know, I think uh, uh, Bob Chapman, who's the uh, the uh, CEO and, and a remarkable individual, uh, but the leader of the Barry Waymiller company, very lean company, uh, incredible culture, uh, and a very, very uh, financially successful company. Uh, it's a winner all the way around. And uh, I think Bob explains it better than anybody, where uh, he points out that, that at some point in time, uh, all of us are going to, you know, in, in his rather blunt way of putting it, you know, somebody's going to dig a hole in the ground and they're going to throw us in it and then stand around and have something to say about our life. And that no one is really going to care at that point in time um, what our margins were, what our market share, how profitability profitable we were. Nobody's going to care whether you made budget or not. Nobody's going to be talking about purchase price variances or labor efficiency. All we're going to talk about is what did we do with the opportunities we had to affect the lives of the people who were around us. You know, and certainly our family and friends, but also uh, in a work-related sense, uh, the people we worked with, if we're managers, the people who worked for us, um, did we have a positive impact on people? And at the end of the day, all business is rooted in a higher power. We're here ultimately to do some social good. We're not here just to make money and then die. Um, that's a pretty dismal life. And so, it, you know, when... When we say it's rooted in a higher power, we really mean that we're serving a higher purpose, whether we're working or at home. And it doesn't matter what faith you have or any faith. You know, anybody who has uh, a basic respect for humanity uh, and feels a, a compassion to do well by people um, is 
is should be striving anyway. I shouldn't say is because there are certainly exceptions. Um, is striving to uh, uh, to satisfy that higher power, that higher calling, or that broader calling. And so, you know, the the goal is is to conduct business in a way that uh, that satisfies that that drive within us to do good. And the uh, the objective is to try to do both: be successful in business uh, and uh, and stay rooted to that higher power. And that's the exciting thing about Lean is it's, it offers the opportunity to do both, um, right. no compromises. Right. When I started my company 30 years ago, my company motto was, I achieve my goals by serving others. And a sales rep really only has their service to offer to their companies they represent and their customers. But going back to the very principle of starting a company, when you be became a corporation back, you know, 100 more years ago, you had to actually apply to have a corporate status to the state legislature, and you had to prove that you were going to have a benefit to the public. And we've lost that. We've lost it totally by just thinking that the, of, you know, company is there to make the most amount of profits as you probably, possibly can. But I believe that a company owes something to their com community and their country and they need to be you know and whether they have whatever the faith they have you know you, you need to have a higher purpose than just making money and making the most money you can yes we have to make money to stay in business but we need to be doing it in a way that makes us feel good and, keep, and where we can keep our integrity and that's the way I have run my business and I think that's what the, becoming a a lean company, transforming the whole culture of your company enables everybody in the company to do, is to feel good about what they're contributing to their company, their community, and their country. That uh, kind, of, kind of gives the term customer service a much, much deeper meaning um, in listening to that. Right. Oh, good. Well, well you know, it, it, really, it, really, it really does, Jim, and you know, one of the fundamental tough questions um, that we're that we're facing now is that uh, you know way back in the 1950s when Charlie Wilson had the the famous quote that was misquoted about uh, what was good for General Motors was good for the country um, and vice versa. What he was really saying was that in those days, successful businesses made a contribution to the country. They yeah. created jobs. They created products. That uh, the interests of the United States and the interests of of the big companies in the United States were one and the same, but it gets harder and harder to uh, to make that case these days. When you have a, a company like Apple or a company like General Electric that uh, that makes a lot of money, but actually employs very few people in the United States, um, when they're profitable or when they take in revenue, it may or may not be good for their employees overseas. Um, and it certainly is good for their their shareholders and the folks on Wall Street, but for the greater United States, um, it's a pretty tough argument to explain why their success is in all of our best interests. Why should I care if Apple makes any money or not? Um, you know that that they don't employ people here, they don't help the economy much here. They make a relatively small number of people very wealthy, but it's not like the old days where it translated into jobs and economic growth. And uh, it's harder and harder when they say, well, what we really need is a tax decrease. Well, my attitude is more and more, no, I, maybe we ought to double the taxes on you. So you're contributing something to the United States. Now, it certainly is not true with the smaller businesses, the, the privately held businesses that do create yeah. jobs. But the big outsourcers, uh, the ones who are basically taking advantage of free trade agreements to do all their employment overseas, and most of the time don't even bring their money back from overseas, um, are actually contributing very little. And, uh, and it gets tougher and tougher to defend them. Yeah, exactly, which is the whole reason I wrote my book, because you know manufacturing jobs are the foundation of the, of the middle class. We lose manufacturing, we lose the middle class. And we have to save it if we want. And we, we need manufacturing to be able to even defend our country because they produce the goods that uh, we rely on for our defense, you know, defense of our country and the military, armed forces. So we, we need to get back to thinking, you know, I, I believe a, a company owes a certain amount of to their country of origin. And what's happened now between Main Street, Wall Street and Main Street is that many of the companies that are on the Dow and the S&P aren't even American-owned companies. 
country companies anymore so they have no loyalty to the United States and they don't care they're just out for to make the most money for themselves and their shareholders so well, that's what we've lost it's the American owned companies that don't have international offices and plants that are bearing the brunt of supporting our government through their taxes because the multinational companies do transfer of profits and reincorporating in tax havens to get away from paying taxes. So that's, that's uh, what's you know, happened on the world level. Well, the other thing that's fading is that, you know, you, as late as 10 years ago, you could make the case that, well, the shareholders are the big pension funds. And uh, so it is good for the, for the retired folks to have their, uh, their pensions in, in these big profitable companies. But more and more, uh, people don't have retirement plans. People don't have pension funds. Um, that case is even getting harder and harder to make. So, you know, we really need to question what, what is the purpose of a business? What is the purpose of a corporation? And if it's not serving some greater good, if it's just making money for a very narrow group of people with no benefits to the rest of the country, the rest of the community, to the, to the folks in general, then uh, why do they even exist and why should we support them or care? Yeah. Uh, me, a business has to be rooted in a in a higher purpose than simply making money. Let me. That's so. that's, a, that's a good comment. So let me ask this question, and then we'll we'll kind of move on to next. But this might be something uh, get comments from both of you on. So one thing I've noticed, and I certainly don't want to say this is this is a case. This is not the case in every case, but there seems seems to be a trend in this manner. If you look at smaller or medium sized companies, and some of the medium sized companies are pretty good size, they tend to be more community focused can tend to be more focused on the benefit of their employees or customers. Again, I don't want to say that's always the case because it isn't more than the very large corporations. Um, it just seems to be more of a more of a struggle as comp as organizations get bigger. Do you guys have any maybe insights or comments on you know what you know kind of why that dynamic might exist? Well I well, I, I certainly have have a strong opinion on it. And you know those those small and medium sized businesses tend to be privately owned. Uh, yeah. Quite a few of them are family-owned, um, and they, when you go into that small business or that medium business, um, the the folks who are in management, quite often the, the folks who own it, are members of the community along with their employees. You might be the vice president in charge or something all day long, um, but the guy three levels below you is your kid's little league coach, and you're just another fan sitting on the bench after work. Now, they all know each other, and, and they care about each other. You know, the other thing is that uh, you know, not only more rooted in the community, but privately held businesses are uh, are more driven by cash. Typically, a privately held company is not too worried about next quarter. They're interested in the long term and they're interested in cash flow, um, not so much paper profits. Um, and so they don't jump through hoops to try to make numbers at the end of a quarter. You know, they tend to do things that uh, that they're better stewards of their money. And they're looking out in the in the long term, and you know all those things come together for a completely different management dynamic than the big publicly traded company for whom cash is almost irrelevant. It's all about paper profits and it's all about quarterly earnings. And uh, right. you know that big company, you know, sends a manager to run the satellite plant out in Topeka, but that person never really bonds in Topeka. They're going to be there for two years and move on to the next stop on the tour. They don't have any ties to the community. They don't even get to know the people. Uh, they're just kind of passing through and, and checking off boxes on the uh, on their career. So you never really get that connection with community. They they really don't care about the long term. Um, they're they're driven uh, purely by short term stock prices, and uh, that that just creates a completely different approach to management and one that uh, that can be pretty ugly. Right, and here in San Diego, we're a startup city where lots of startup businesses. I mean, I'm a director on the San Diego Inventors Forum and a mentor for our Incubator Without Walls program, and there's lots of startup companies. And when they succeed, they're they're more. Most of them are what we would call lifestyle companies. They want to be in business for the long term, built to last kind of companies. But when they grow to a certain uh, point, they get to be targets for out-of-state companies to buy them and then the whole it, everything changes because when they're privately held and they're here and they live here they don't want to move anywhere else they are involved in the community they may, may be on you know local boards and 
church, you know, church trustees or something. So they're very involved in their community. When they're bought, when these companies are bought by an out-of-state company, if they do keep them in San Diego, the whole focus of the company changes. They don't have local autonomy to be able to contribute to the community. They have to, you know, go through the corporate to be able to make any donations to community causes, and the whole focus of the company just becomes on making those, you know, quarterly profits, the numbers, et cetera. And so, and but a lot of the times the companies actually get moved, and most people don't realize that they're really just buying the product because people don't transfer out of San Diego to somewhere else. They want to stay in San Diego, so they leave the company. And the company is moving just the product, production of the product, to another state. They've lost all the people. And they get back, it's back to the lean thinking that people are the heart of the company, not the product. New products can be designed. It's not the product. It's not the equipment you have to make the product. It's the people that are in designing and developing new products for the company to succeed in the long run. Good. Well, great. Well, that's an, uh, thank you guys for your comments. That gives a good insight into uh, what we mean by rooted in a higher power. Some good discussion on that. So with that, and I know this relates to it, we'll kind of ask the next question is, um, you comment on uh, creating um, more than a feel-good culture. So if you can comment on what does that mean to create more than a feel-good culture? Well, you know, when I when I, uh, you know, first wrote that phrase, you know, there are an awful lot of uh, companies that, that talk about their culture, but by their culture, it really is almost a, uh, a condescending paternalistic thing. You know, we we have a good culture because we because we have parties and because we we talk nice to people and because we have a few fringe benefits that that uh, that people like. And so, uh, you know, we superficially. Uh, we're, we're very nice to people, um, but if you haven't changed the, the core of the business, where you have genuine respect for people, where you really do appreciate the fact that I don't care what your level is in the organization, you know more about that job than I ever will, even if I'm four levels above you. And if I understand that the people who are on the floor are the ones actually creating value, um, but it's genuine respect, not condescending respect, and probably more important, I don't have uh, metrics that are measuring people like cattle, uh, and I don't use the word headcount. I don't focus my, you know, all my efforts on direct labor efficiency. Um, you know, if I haven't done those things, then I've really just kind of got a feel-good culture. If at the end of the day, when there's an economic downturn, if those people are going to be put on the chopping block and laid off, then I haven't really embraced a, a, a true, inclusive, respectful culture. Um, and there are an awful lot of those superficial feel-good cultures, you know, companies that talk a good game, but at the first sign of a downturn, they're closing plants and laying off people. And then you find out that that culture was hollow. It felt good while times were good, but it collapsed as soon as uh, the first headwinds came along. Right, and the, and the difference, too, is the fact that, you know, I've been part of two startup companies in my past, and when you're, you know, part of a five- or six-person team starting a company, you wear many hats, and then maybe as the company grows, you focus on the one hat that you're best at. But you, you know the company, and in a lean culture, in a real lean culture, you're cross-trained, so you can do, you know, all the various tasks of your department because you get cross-trained. So you're not just put in a, a slot where you have to stay. You you know the goal of and you're compensated by how much you have learned and you're willing to learn and, and what level of expertise you get on that. So it's a whole different way of compensating people for their knowledge and experience and ability to transmit this knowledge to other people through training. So. To me, that's one of the keys of, you know, it's more than just a feel-good culture. That's, that's some good points. Well, you know, I think uh, maybe, a, maybe a very uh, a direct example is a, a company that uh, that I've worked with for, for quite a while, you know, uh, and we've talked about how uh, when they first started on their lean journey, um, when the employee said uh, that, you know, they the, the – trash containers out on the factory floor were in bad places and they wanted to move them, 
their feel good culture, you know, allowed them to feel like they were doing a good good thing by calling the employees together for their input and their suggestions on where the trash container should be. The genuine lean culture that they evolved to within a few years was one that acknowledged that senior management had no knowledge whatsoever on optimal trash locations. I don't care what your engineering degree was or where you got your MBA, there was nothing to qualify to as a trash expert. And so their answer two years later was, you put them wherever you want. And they're yours. You have complete authority and control. And so are you viewing people as suggestion inputs or are you truly empowering people to, to make decisions? And trash is obviously kind of superficial. But a feel-good culture has a suggestion box. Uh, a true lean culture has, has empowerment. We don't need the suggestions. When they get the idea, they implement it. So, right. Right. Are, are, so, so those are good, some, some good, I guess, starting points for people to consider. Are there any other some basic highlights of these actions that uh, people can do or start with to kind of help help drive their organization to not have a feel-good culture but a true lean um, engaged culture well you know it all starts and, and ends really with the level of uh, of humility of the people at the top you know it's the fact is you know if you can't sit around the table and truly in your heart believe that everybody at this table knows something important that I don't know, um, then you're never going to get off the off the first base. But it it you know really comes with with uh, uh, starting with groups of people and genuinely empowering them to make change in their workplace and uh, and management gaining the comfort level and knowing that that if they do that things are going to work out well. You know it's awfully hard for management to let go. And so, uh, so letting go, it's going to happen slowly, but learning how to let go of the small things on the factory floor and then evolving into letting go of the big things, and not just the factory floor, throughout the company. Yeah. Um, but management has to uh, get to the point that it, it really trusts people to make the right decision. Um, right. In my experience also, I've seen that too many times when companies go through a downturn in the economy or whatever, they often lay off their engineers in the engineering department. Well, when they do that, they're, they're losing the know-how of the company. It's yeah. the engineers that are designing the new products, that are improving the manufacturing processes of the current products, and they don't really know that they're losing the real heart of their company. That you know, I I know of one company last year that laid off their whole all of their engineering staff, including the engineering manager that had been with the company for 25 years. I mean, wow. that's that's a sad thing that that you're actually losing the heart of your company when you do that, and that's where you're thinking of people as just that head count to reduce your costs. Yeah, and well, you know, and, 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 and I really. I really think, Jim, we might be getting ahead of ourselves and getting into a little bit of accounting here, but uh, yeah. But uh, what you'll find that, that the companies that, that truly commit to this journey um, very early on come to the conclusion that the labor cost is a fixed cost, that, that they take laying people off off the table, um, and the same with, with suppliers. It actually is the easiest and laziest management in the world. To, to fix a, an economic problem or a business problem by just laying people off. Um, you know, it doesn't take doesn't take a whole lot of uh, education or knowledge to do the math and do that and fix the problem. But you've uh, you've caused great people. You probably caused great harm to the company in the long term. Um, but you'll find that the companies that are successful at this simply take that option off the table. The senior management is going to the staff saying. We got to figure out how to make more money, and laying off people and whacking suppliers and going to China is not one of your your choices. So get to work, get creative, figure out another way. And it requires creativity, and it requires a lot of work. And you know, but they the, the committed companies find another way. But by simply taking the easy solution to problems off the table and challenging management um, to find other solutions to problems. Um, it starts to work and it starts to spin up to a higher level. Um, but it really is almost that simple. Just telling them, you know, we're, we're not going to make our numbers this year. 
um, which is going to create a big problem. So you guys need to figure out a way to make the numbers. And by the way, laying people off is not one of the acceptable uh, solutions. Um, right. Yes, it creates a challenge. Good. Um, so what what we'll do? We'll roll into the roll into the next thing, and, and the next su subject is kind of want you both again to kind of explain the meaning behind this is stewardship. And in the book, Bill, you have the uh, stewardship kind of is the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So if we maybe go through, what does that mean for the lean enterprise as far as stewardship? You know, stewardship. Uh, you know, and it's it's interesting. And I, you know, I come at it from a Christian perspective. You know, but but every faith basically takes the same uh, the same approach, just a little bit different language. Um, but it's essentially saying that uh, that we didn't create the earth, we didn't create all of the resources, we didn't create all of this, um, but we were given care over it, and we were given stewardship over it. Um, it's ours to use wise, wise, excuse me, wisely, um, and ours to use for for good. To use to make helpful products. Um, to use to make people's lives better through the the goods that we we create, the goods that we make. Um, but it's both a waste of money, and it's a failure of stewardship for us to waste the resources of the world. Um, so if we're using too much energy, if we're using too much packaging, if we're creating too much scrap, creating a, a cost for our, our company, but we're failing in our responsibility to be good stewards of the planet. Um, and I think that uh, you, know, you can make the stewardship case also with regard to people, that, that we are the stewards of the people who committed to us and committed their family to us. But you know, for the most part, I think the relevance is talking about the relationship between environmental concerns and lean, um, and waste is waste. Um, whether we're wasting uh, natural resources or we're wasting money, they tend to be one and the same. Everything in lean is good for the environment. Well, and we're also wasting people when we don't utilize them and help them grow to their full potential. So that's part of it. And it, and it ties in with servant leadership that, you know, my goal as my company, ser serve, you know, use, achieve your goals by serving others because we all have something to give. And when we help people be able to give more by learning more and being more, you know, expert at what they're doing, then we are sort of being you know, responsible stewards of their talents and their, you know, development as people. So we do that for both people, resources, and our natural environment. And so we can then be taking better care. I think stewardship is actually taking care of something, taking whether it's taking care of a person, an animal, or your, you know, your, your environment. So we're taking better care of people through stewardship. That's good. Yeah, you know, actually. You're, 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 you're exactly right, Michelle. And, and I can never remember the guy's name, but uh, you know, Toyota was very influenced by a, a Japanese guy who, uh, again, the name escapes me, but he was kind of an odd character, but he was both a, uh, a classical industrial engineer and a psychiatrist and kind of blended a lot of theories along <clears> with <throat> combining the two. But one of his fundamental principles was that certainly – an employee has a, a moral uh, obligation not to waste um, his employer's time. If you're being paid to work, then you should work. Um, you can't slack off on the job, otherwise you're stealing from the company. But there's an equal responsibility for the company not to waste the employee's time. That people's time on earth is very limited. And so if your employer is wasting it on non-productive work, creating scrap, doing things that are unnecessary, you're stealing precious time from this person on earth. Um, but it goes along with what Michelle was saying, is that uh, we have a responsibility for people's time and talents that they give to us, that they're used wisely and fully, and that we're not wasting people's time on things that don't need to be done or on things that are not being done properly. Yeah, those right. are good, good points, John. And both of you talking about the resources. You know, I heard you talk about, you know, wisely using them, you know, for, certainly for the, the good, the greater good of uh, society, as well as with taking care of our, you know, our people, and uh, and all your comments that are interesting in this subject are really tying directly back into the two previous topics the two of you were discussing um, about that, you know, how to not have a feel good culture, but a true lean culture, and also too, what uh, what does it mean to have a higher power? Well, let's um, 
let's let's talk about one more thing here um, while we're on, and that's um, also related to what we've been talking about. Is you talk about we're all in this together. So, kind of define and explain what you mean by we're all in this together. Although I think you've touched on a few of the points in our conversation thus far. You know, I I think uh, that management of uh, of a business, you know, as complicated and as laden with buzzwords and theories as we make it, is really fairly simple. And I think that uh, that the basic priorities and the skill set and the focus that it takes to be a leader of a family um, are pretty much the same as what it takes to be uh, a uh, the, the manager of a of a business. And that that is, uh, you know, if when you're when you're leading your family, when you're raising your family. You're concerned about putting out a good product. When your kids are all grown up and going out, you're making sure their heads are screwed on straight and they understand their values and priorities. And their, you know, it's a it's a good product that you put out into the world. You're concerned about the money, always balancing the short-term needs with the long-term, and continually looking at, at uh, how do we keep this in balance uh, to keep the ship afloat, but to make sure we're good in the long haul. Um, and you're also concerned about making sure nobody gets left behind. That uh, that none of the kids stray too far from the from the herd. You know that that uh, having you know having three kids and raising two out of three well isn't good enough. You want to keep them all all on the right path. And I think that it's it kind of goes with that saying we're all in this together. Um, if the if the CEO is successful, but a number of people's uh, families and careers and lives were were terribly harmed in the process, then he's failed. Everybody needs to succeed. You know, at all levels of the company, we all need to go along for the ride and commit to the idea that we're all dependent on each other. The guy who sweeps the floor has to be do just as good a job as the CEO and everybody in between. If everybody does their job and everybody looks out for each other, then everybody can succeed. Um, when we start playing it off against each other, that my success is more important than the company's success, then uh, things start to come apart. And and Bill, also, it's easier to to understand that concept of we're all in it together when you're part of a startup team because it's only the small group of you. And I had the opportunity to learn that early on because I had the opportunity to be part of a startup company when I was only 18 years old. I was hmm. hired as a secretary for one company, and a few months later, the, the my my supervisor, or a good, my boss, who was the engineering manager, said, I'm leaving the company to go start a company with five other guys. Would you like to go with? So I did. So I was part of a six-person team, and I got to do so many things that no other 18-year-old would you know, have to do. I set up the office. I bought all the stuff, I, all the office equipment and supplies. I, bought, I set up all the office systems. I did marketing research and purchasing. I did so many things. And you're really all in together. It's, it's harder for somebody that goes into a bigger company to understand that concept because they're not part of that original team that grows the company. But if you are if you have the understanding that every single person in the company is really part of the marketing team to market your company as the best company to do business with in all the aspects of the company, whether you're the shipping person or you're the purchasing agent or you know not just the sales team it's every single person of the company that's giving that impression to other people of what kind of a company you are and why you should want to do business with that company well there certainly is a uh, you know the cross functional element of lean is one of the most powerful aspects cuz it knocks down those uh, those functional silos knocks down this idea that that sales was successful and production wasn't or you know that this department did a good job and that department did a bad job you know they really kind of pits people against each other um, but that cross-functional nature of the startup company is what you're striving for in the bigger more mature company is how to get people to break down those barriers how to function as one team understanding that uh, the customer is only satisfied when all of the functions along that value stream Contribute and succeed and help each other. Um, and that's why lean. That's why lean 
facilitates and is driven by a team environment. You know, everybody has to play a part in order for the customer to be satisfied. The customer doesn't care if engineering did a great job, but but supply chain failed. It's a failure to them. They're not going to give credit to one department. You know, it's either uh, an all or none. Either we all work together and, and successfully satisfied the customer, or we didn't. Um, and so, you know, you really have to be looking out for each other, covering for each other, working together closely in order to really take care of the customer. And that's what the lean companies do very, very well. Right. Good. All right. Well, um, actually, thank you both. We're actually a little bit past our target time, so I think we'll, we'll stop here. But some excellent discussion, very insightful. And just through the whole conversation, I think um, – all this discussion really, in a way, circles back around uh, in a sense of operate, you know, of or how organizations operate in a sense rooted in that higher power. I mean, the things we talked about with, you know, creating a, a true clean culture, not a feel good culture, the the aspect and things to consider with stewardship as well as with related, you know, we're all in this together. Really, go comes back to how do we operate, or um, so we are rooted in that higher power. So again, Michelle and Bill, thank you very much for your uh, comments and insight. And uh, with that, we'll throw it back to Jacqueline, and thank you, everyone, for joining in with us. All right. Well, Jim, Bill, and Michelle, thank you so much for facilitating our session today. Um, if you're interested in learning more on this subject, Michelle will be speaking at the Lean Accounting Summit held in San Antonio on August 25th through the 26th. And Bill has been a regular presenter at the Lena Accounting Summit, although he is unable to attend this year. So if you want to learn more, please visit www.leanaccountingsummit.com. Um, we also want to offer a special discount code for everyone tuning in today. So to receive a discount off the Lena Accounting Summit, please use the discount code WEBINAR for 10% off the summit price. Um, it's listed on the screen as well, but again, that is webinar for 10% off the summit price. So to wrap up for today, I wanted to remind you that the webinar is being recorded. Look for an email following our time together for a link to the recording. And feel free to share this throughout your organization. So again, thank you, Jim, Bill, and Michelle, and thanks to each of you for participating in today's session. Goodbye.